Hello, 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 hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, wish. <laughs> We are, we are live to the world. Uh, hope you all had an excellent lunch. Uh, hope you didn't all drink too much. Uh, so you don't sleep, you won't, you're not going to sleep through this next session anyway. A uh, couple of things, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, the guy, we are live streaming here, so if you are asking a question, if you could perhaps stand up, if you could wait for the microphone, to arrive and then stand up when you're asking your question. It just looks better on camera. You know? so, and also, they can hear what the question is. So the microphone thing is more important. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if you had been looking at the, the schedule and, uh, and the speakers, etc., etc., you will know that uh, Todd Leopold was meant to be one of the speakers. Uh, sadly, Todd who in Seattle came down with a very, very bad case of food poisoning. And although he did his presentation, he spoke for about 10 minutes and then essentially collapsed. Uh, and after that, he was incredibly apologetic for he's one of the nicest men in the world. And I said, not a problem, Todd. You're straight into the next one, OK? And he isolated himself for 11 days before uh, getting the flight. Uh, and on the 12th day, he went into the distillery and got COVID. Uh, which, yeah, I know you can laugh you, you know, with your dark sense of humour. Uh, but yeah, so sadly, Todd uh, couldn't be with us, which is a, a real shame because his distillery uh, really has pioneered sustainable distilling in, in the US. Uh, family owned, big distillery, a uh, whole lot of different sets of stills, uh, no vacuum stills, but a recreation of a 19th century three chambered still. Uh, using local barley, uh, encouraging wild yeast, et cetera, et cetera, really leading the way uh, in sustainable distilling in the US, where it has been fairly slow in the uptake. So I was really, so really, really sorry. So I'm sure we wish Todd all the best. And fingers crossed we might see him in 2024. <laughs> okay. So uh, he might be watching. Todd, get better soon. Uh, right. Our afternoon session is about building. Uh, and indeed sustaining sustainable uh, distilleries. So we've got four fantastic speakers, uh, two from Scotland, uh, yeah, quite close to each other in Scotland, in fact, uh, one from Germany and one from Sweden. So nice kind of spread of sizes, approaches uh, to this incredibly complex subject. Our first speaker is Annabel Thomas from Nian. Uh, I first met Annabel in, in a bar uh, in the Quake Bar, it was a sophisticated bar, you understand, uh, in the Quake Bar uh, at uh, Kregelke Hotel. Uh, and she said, I'm, I'm about to build a distillery. And I went, oh, yeah, where are you building a distillery? And she said, uh, uh, Drimnin Estate. I went, God, where's that? She went, well, you know Mull? It's kind of opposite Mull. I'm thinking, that's a pretty obscure place to build a distillery, but great. Uh, and then she said, and I'm going to make it organic. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> here we go. And she did. Uh, the whiskey was launched in 2020. Uh, net zero. Uh, in fact, net zero since day one, almost. Uh, uh, B Corp. You just got B Corp status as well. And if you are driving to Nicknean, and I heartily encourage you to do so, you will find it is at the end of the road, literally at the end of the road. But I like to think it's also at the beginning of the road, Beginning of the road, well, that's good. Beginning of the road, uh, in terms of a distillery's history, but also in terms of the thinking behind uh, a, a new way uh, for Scotch whisky. Annabel, over to you. Thank you very much, Dave. Can everyone hear me? Um, do you think we could get my slides up? Amazing. Here we go. Um, so, thank you for that introduction. As Dave said, I'm Annabelle. I run Nick Nian. It is primarily a family business. It's on my parents' farm on the west coast of Scotland, opposite the Isle of Mull. And that is part of the reason for choosing such an obscure location to build a distillery. And trust me, at many points in this process have I wished we had chosen a less obscure location. <laughs> um, 
I started it really with two aims. One was to pioneer sustainable production, and that is what I will focus on today. But we're also very interested in creating interesting spirits, and we might talk about that a little bit later in the Q&A. Um, we started production in 2017. That was after I had spent four years raising cash and building it from the ground up. It's in an old farmsteading. Um, and we produce primarily single malt whiskey, but we also have a botanical spirit, which is a kind of gin whiskey hybrid. We redistill our new make with botanicals, and there'll be some around later of both of those for everyone to taste. Um, but one thing that many people don't know about me is that I used to be a strategy consultant in London. And if anyone has ever been a strategy consultant, they will know that this largely consists of making slides. I now have a slightly allergic reaction to slides. So we only have three today. <laughs> uh, and the rest of it will be me talking. Anyway, I want to cover three things. Firstly, what is sustainability in my view? Secondly, what do we do? Because I am not a world expert in sustainability. I'm just here to share our experiences. And please feel free to ask me as many questions as you want afterwards, because that's where I can be most useful to everybody. Um, and then also talk about what the future holds, both for other people in this world, but also for us. So firstly, how do we think about sustainability? It is enormously complex. And as was referred to earlier today, it is not just about carbon although arguably at the moment that might be the most important. There are many other aspects to it. I've put three up here, which is water, conserving and using water sensibly, waste, and really we need to be thinking of waste as a resource and moving towards a completely circular economy, and biodiversity, which um, some of these will sometimes conflict with each other in decisions that we have to make, and I'll try and bring some of those examples out as we go through, but we can't always optimize for all four of these, and that is part of what's so hard about sustainability, is making the right decisions at the right time in the right area. Um, so, what is it that we actually do? These are the main things and the things that I wanted to tackle when I started the distillery. I'll talk about a few of the other smaller things that we do as well. Um, the first is that we are net zero for scopes one and two, so that is for our own production. That's what we do on site, and that is because we're powered by renewable energy. We decided to use a biomass boiler, so we have a forest that is literally right next door to the distillery. It is a commercial forest. It was planted to be harvested. We harvest and replant at least as many trees as we harvest. Uh, we dry ourselves on site, and one of our distillers is also our wood chipper. So we are the proud owners of a wood chipper and a chip trailer. And about two times a week, Simon goes up into the forest and leaves the stills in Lorna's hands, and he goes chi and chips some more wood. Um, we chose that because it's the right answer for us. It is definitely not the right answer for everybody, and using a biomass boiler is not as simple <laughs> as many other heating solutions in the distillery. But it was the right thing for us to do in our location. The second is 100% organic Scottish barley. This was something that was very important to me. I, um, I felt like I really wanted to ensure that the supply chain that we were effectively responsible for in the farming community, we were doing the absolute best thing we could for that land that was being impacted by us. So we chose to only buy organic barley. Um, we did that really because of the biodiversity and input or lack of input benefits that you get from that. Um, and you can really see that when you go to the farms. It, they feel completely different from the conventional farmlands that I grew up around in East Anglia. They're full of birds and bees, and there's loads of flowers in the fields. And it just feel, and you know, the surrounding areas and the edges of the fields look completely different as well. Um, and we also source all of it from Scotland. That is, we have the advantage of being small and being able to source it all from Scotland but also it has a carbon footprint benefit because the transport miles for that barley is much less. The third thing is water. Um, we have a re very unusual water cooling system, so a lot of distilleries would either abstract from and then return to a river, um, which is why a lot of Scottish distilleries at least are based near rivers, or you would look at a cooling tower. We didn't really want to, well, we don't have a river, so that wasn't an option. We didn't really want to use a cooling tower because of the energy and the chemical inputs that that uh, has. So we decided to dig an enormous pond. 
which we call our cooling pond. Um, this was one of the low lights of our construction process because <laughs> it didn't hold water. So we then had to drain what was effectively a muddy soup at the bottom of this pond, which is difficult if you've not thought about putting a drain in already, um, and line it. Uh, and we had to line it in October or November to get ready for the start of our production, which was in early 2017, so this was late 2016. And the lining suppliers said, right, you need to have a digger and a driver, obviously, which we didn't have on site. And you also need to find a day in October or November in Scotland where there's hardly any wind and it's not raining. <laughs> there was basically one day and no digger driver, so I spent about a week calling every digger driver I could conceivably think of and managed to basically bribe one of them to come. So we do now have a functioning cooling pond. It freaked our engineers out because they couldn't calculate the cooling capacity of this pond and they couldn't tell us for sure it will hold water. Um, but it does. And um, all we use is this cooling pond. We have one pump that takes it from the pond and up to the condensers, which are slightly higher than the pond, and then it goes back to the pond via gravity. Um, we do, in our production, we work around the fact that that is a natural being, so it is naturally warmer in the summer than it is in the winter. So we produce two spirit types. One of those is a much more kind of traditional style, if you want, if you like. So we have lower cut points, for example, and we're not so interested in capturing those higher alcohols that come off the still first. And so the temperature in the spirit safe is not as important. So we make that in the summer when the cooling pond is warmer. And then in the winter, we make our other kind of spirit, which is much higher cut points, kind of a more classic young spirit recipe. Zero waste. Um, I, I think whenever you build a new manufacturing plant of any kind, but in particular a distillery, you've got to consider what you do with the waste. We are very lucky in that we are on a farm and our waste is very much integrated with that in a traditional Scottish way. So we have cows that eat the barley and we spread our pot ale and other effluent on the fields as a light fertilizer. But we take it further than that. Um, we measure every single bit of waste that goes out of our distillery. So Amy, who's our head of sustainability, has the glamorous job of actually weighing the bins every single week <laughs> so that we can report on it. So those, those kind of first four things were what we did when we set up the distillery. And I wanted to tackle the kind of big, big hairy bits. But we obviously didn't have to think about packaging at that point because we didn't have anything to package. When it came to bottling our whiskey, which, as Dave said, we st first had in a bottle in 2020, we were lucky enough to find a company called Estelle, who had spent five years working on producing a 100% recycled clear glass bottle, which was the first time it had been done. Um, and this was pretty exciting for us. We really wanted a clear bottle, because I think when you're a new distillery, it's quite important for consumers to be able to see what they're buying and get that trust going. Um, but at the time, the only clear bottles available were kind of 80 to 90% virgin materials. But Estelle had found a way and a partner to allow them to produce this 100% recycled clear glass bottle, which on a per bottle basis reduces the carbon emissions by 40%, which is pretty amazing. And the simple reason for that is it's basically less energy intensive to melt glass than it is to melt sand and to create glass. Um, and the final thing, as Dave said, is we are also a certified B Corporation. I don't know how many of you are familiar with B Corps, but it is basically a... It's like being organic certified or fair trade certified, but it's like a certification for your entire business and looks at how sustainable you are, not just for the planet, but also for the people, for, or for people and society. So it's a kind of... They call it the triple bottom line. People, planet, profit. Um, it is an extremely rigorous process, <laughs> so don't attempt it lightly if anyone's thinking about it, but it's incredibly beneficial and I would highly recommend it. Um, we got a very high score because of all the things that we do from a sustainability point of view, but it also uh, looks at the other elements of sustainability, which were touched on somewhat this morning and I also think are really important, like people and community. So, as Dave mentioned, we are really, really remote and we are in a tiny community. There are 50 houses at our end of the road. 
11 miles or half an hour at the other end of the road, there is the metropolis of Loch Arlen, which has 300 people. <laughs> but part of another thing that we wanted to achieve when building the distillery was creating long-term skills, sustainable jobs in this tiny community, rather than, for example, tourism jobs, which are obviously only really there for six months of the year. Um, so it also thinks about things like that. Do you pay your people a living wage and all those sorts of elements? Um, it is a nice thing to have from a communi consumer communication point of view, but really the value in it is in the things it makes you think about when you're going through the certification. And it asks you questions like, do you blind screen recruitment applicants? Hmm. No, we don't, but wouldn't that be a good idea? And that's really easy to do. You know, do you at least annually review your social environmental KPIs at board level? Hmm. Well, actually, no, we don't, but that would be a really good thing to do. So it makes you put in place all of these actually quite small and easy steps that are incredibly beneficial to how you run the business. So those are the big things. We also sweat the small stuff as well, whether that is the chemicals that we use to clean the distillery, and Alex and I were talking about this on the way over, but we switched from caustic cleaning in the whole distillery to using an enzyme called Enzibrew. Uh, we tried it across the whole distillery. We still haven't made it work in the mash tunnel, though Alex told me on the way over here that they may have made it work, so watch this space. Uh, but we have been using it to clean the wash still very successfully. It has massive benefits. Not only are we not dealing with caustic soda, which has many disadvantages, including from a people point of view, but it also leaves our wash still sparkling clean. Um, on the packaging side, we try and think about all the other elements of that. So we only use natural cork, which is incredible from a carbon point of view. We only use natural wood stoppers, so our kind of stopper part of the bottle is 100% compostable. We make gift boxes optional on every single one of our core whiskey SKUs. Uh, we still have more work to do to actually persuade our customers rather than our consumers, but our customers to buy the non-gift box SKU. But if they do buy it, it is 90% recycled material and it is only made of cardboard. So there's no kind of integrated metal or anything in there, which makes it super easy for it to be recycled at the end of its life. Um, and we use plant-based closures and things like that. So that is a little overview of what we do at the moment. But what next? So I guess the first thing to say is that I really truly believe that sustainability is a very individual or company specific thing. Just because what we do at Nicknean is one thing, it doesn't mean that it works for everybody else. And I think biomass is the easiest example of that, but it won't be truly sustainable from a whole business perspective. It just doesn't suit any specific company. Um, getting started is the most important, a bit like with the Enzy Brew. It didn't work in the whole of our process, but we thought, well, at least we can cut half of the caustic out and start using the Enzy Brew here. Getting started is the first thing, and you can iterate from there. This was also mentioned this morning. Carbon footprinting is key, because if you don't have the data, you don't know where to focus. So we, do, we now do a carbon footprint every year. We didn't do it from the start. We only did it when we started producing whiskey, because until you've actually got something in the bottle, you're kind of missing half of your carbon footprint in terms of the packaging. Um, but doing that carbon footprint every year allows us to forecast what we think our carbon footprint will be in the future based on our sales targets. But most importantly, it allows us to think about where to focus to make further reductions. We are by no means perfect. We're net zero for scope one and two, but our scope three emissions are massive, 242 tons last year, and we're only at the beginning of our journey. And that is really what it's all about next for us is tackling those scope three emissions. It is really hard <laughs> scope three because they're all by definition they're in your supply chain and thus out of your control so we're looking at a whole range of things there um one of them is for example work trying to work with the organic farmers that we use which is basically two for most almost all of our production and try to get them to start using more regenerative methods that has a benefit in both soil health, although organic does a lot of that anyway, but mostly in the carbon stored in the soil. Um, we are also looking at further packaging improvements. We're looking at carbon capture, all sorts of different things, uh, some of which the technology is far away. Some of it is much closer. Um, again, we're not able to, well, we don't have the resources to develop the technology ourselves, but we can partner with other people, encourage other people, and try and work in the right direction. 
but we're also trying to do something much broader, which is influence all of our suppliers. So we send out supplier questionnaires every year, which asks our suppliers things like, have you done a carbon footprint? Do you measure your gender pay gap? And obviously for massive suppliers, they have to do a lot of this stuff as regu for regulation, but we try to work with smaller local suppliers and they haven't. And we hope that just by asking these questions of companies every year, encourages them to start doing it. So even if they don't have a carbon footprint this year, by two years time, they might have one and be able and be able to supply us with the info. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll be picking up uh, with questions later. Thank you so, so much, Annabelle. It's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing distillery, great story, and yeah, lots and lots of, of things to ask there. Uh, our second speaker, uh, Bastian Hauser, uh, from where, where are you, Bastian? Ah, oh, there he is, uh, from Stork Club uh, at Spreewood uh, Distillery in Germany. Uh, Basti, I've known for uh, longer than we probably care to admit. Uh, he was the, one of the founders of uh, Bar Convent Berlin, and I don't know if any of you have been to that behemoth of a show, but uh, it used to be a much smaller event, uh, but a great one. And he, he, would, he would very kindly uh, quite often ask me to come and do talks. So I'm delighted that uh, the boot is now on the other foot and I can watch him <laughs> panic on stage. Uh, he, this, uh, well, he will explain what uh, Stork Club uh, is all about. Uh, it's an amazing story, uh, rye, whiskey, organic, uh, and just uh, an, a, another beacon, I think, for how to make a distillery sustainable in the 21st century. Basti, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dave, for having, having me here. It's uh, quite an honor uh, because we are uh, fairly new to the to the whiskey business um, in comparison to some others uh, that are here. And um, yeah, so uh, when Dave asked me um, uh, to speak here, uh, I was thinking, okay, how, how am I going to do this? Uh, what am I talking about? We're only there five and a half years, so it's not uh, not a lot. Um, but I thought, okay, uh, I need to explain first how we actually came um, to the whiskey business, which was by chance. Um, and there is there's uh, quite a few friends stories in this room, um, uh, be it Kiro or, or Stowning, uh, probably other uh, friends stories, uh, where friends come together and think um, we, we need to make whiskey. Uh, for us, it was a bit different. Um, we never wanted to make whiskey. Um, it was not in our plans. Uh, we only, only wanted to buy a cask of whiskey and came back with a distillery um, and then had to sort out things. And then uh, the distillery was already producing um, small amounts of uh, single malt whiskey. Um, it's a touristy region about 60 kilometers south of Berlin. And um, so, yeah, um, we, we just kind of fell in love with the place and thought, okay, we, we want to make whiskey now. Uh, we need to make whiskey now. And uh, how are we going to do it? Um, so because of the, because it, it was, um, uh, in, in terms of timing, it was quite, uh, the, the previous owner wanted to sell. Um, we needed to get money quickly. Um, so there was no time to make big business plans, talk to investors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we all threw in money, um, asked friends for money, um, and asked the bank for money. Um, so we ended up with a big, big, big bank, bank loan, um, which uh, we are still paying back. That had um, definitely some influence on how we um, set up the distillery. Um, nonetheless, uh, we invested, uh, at least at this point, point probably way too much into uh, um, stills and fermenters and uh, mesh tons and uh, mills, et cetera, et cetera. So money was uh, flowing out. Um, but uh, at some point, uh, we, we always had to see, OK, uh, what can we do um, to save some money? Uh, and, and through that, um, a lot of, um, yeah, probably now at least um, uh, uh, 
fitting into the sustainability discussion of today, um, a lot of things kind of happen on the way. Um, not even always thinking about that, um, uh, visionary, uh, but just kind of things went. So, um, so we are still uh, very, very tiny. Um, not a lot of you have heard of us, um, but we are 100% rye whiskey uh, distillery. Um, and uh, yeah, this is um, basically us three. That, that, that's the third person, uh, uh, Stefan, um, my business partner, who's uh, doing the production. Sebastian is in the room as well. Um, yeah. And uh, when I thought about, okay, sustainability, um, I did my bit of, of research as well. How, how, how is it defined? Just like other uh, previous speakers uh, as well. And I will come back um, to the to the three dimensions again, um, because I think it's very important that um, if you, especially if you're a small business, um, you uh, need to probably think about uh, certain things first. Um, and it's not right away uh, CO2 output and, and how to um, diminish that. It's probably more the social dimension, the economic dimension, and then um, as a third part uh, in the equation, um, the environmental dimension. So when we uh, um, took over the distillery, or we took over an existing team, which wasn't really a team. Um, new people came in, um, so uh, we needed to create a, a, a proper team uh, first, and, and that was our our main goal. But um, it's definitely there's there's a few crew crew members uh, who work for us now, um, and uh, I think the the social dimension is is very important to take care of first before you uh, think of um, uh, as I said. Um, uh, certain things to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, you should uh, think about treating your team fair, um, treat everyone equal, um, but also your suppliers. I think that's something uh, we already heard here. Um, your consumers, um, yeah, um, be be a fair business uh, man, woman, um, and uh, create a, a good team vibe uh, so you can tackle um, all the challenges that, that come. Um, uh, later on. And uh, another dimension that's uh, often overlooked uh, is the economic dimension. Um, so you have to create a sustainable business um, because if we run out of money um, and go bankrupt, uh, that's not a sustainable business, I guess, um, uh, from my point of view at least. Um, and probably uh, our team wouldn't really um, like that as well uh, because they would go out of money and um, and a job. So uh, it's, of course, not just for us, but also for others. Um, be it your suppliers, uh, to pay them fair. Um, I think uh, those um, things have, have already been uh, said as well, um, but also for others. So just a few more bottles. And, and we are almost there to be a sustainable business, um, um, but we are working on it. Yeah? Um, so this uh, is um, basically now uh, talking about the, um, the the third dimension, environmental uh, dimension of um, CO2. So uh, as I said, we. Um, it, was a process, and um, just last year we did a like a big energy audit, uh, is what I, I'll call it. Uh, so some engineers came in and took a look at all our um, uh, at our production and, and uh, calculated where, where comes uh, our carbon to uh, emissions, and uh, it was quite helpful to see um, uh, where a lot of it uh, comes from. So um, this. Is um, basically they, they looked at our our production site uh, where we um, do our whiskey and, and calculated and and uh, what you see here is basically um, it it 
comes down to the biggest part uh, of it being the gas that we use to uh, fire you know, our stills and, and uh, to yeah do all the heating um, in our process, and uh, about um, uh, thirty percent is uh, power uh, electricity. Um, and uh, what I've what he also told me is uh, that that in this. Uh, calculation what's not really inside is is actually the the, the same amount of car, uh, co2 um, that comes from fermentation just uh, and and we, we don't have the technique we didn't have the money to uh, build anything to uh, uh, catch it um, and and uh, use it differently so that's quite a big thing but um, I think w what is uh, quite interesting is um, and we didn't really talk a lot yet uh, about the whole gas uh, situation because I think this mo most of the stills here uh, will be uh, currently fired uh, with gas. Um, we don't know how, how long we'll get it, um, uh, uh, as, as, uh, at least at some point. So um, that was basically, okay, uh, where we saw, uh, where we saw um, okay, what can we do? Um, and then he he told us um, how much it would cost uh, to get rid of the gas in our distillery and, and uh, to you know uh, build new stills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we said okay, and that that would only result in about fifty percent reduction of CO two, but a big investment for us. Um, so um, you always have to kind of taken into account, although um, I'd love to do this and um, we would love to do all, all sorts of uh, things, but these investments sometimes just don't make sense because we have new stills. Um, they're from 2017 um, or 2016, so um, if you just rip it out, uh, put a new one in, it uh, doesn't really sound sustainable to me um, either. Um, so. I think for a small distillery, it's it's uh, very important um, to think about like the low hanging fruits um, uh, because if you don't have the money, um, you you can't do those kind of investments. Um, so uh, a few of those those low hanging fruits uh, that are out there that can already uh, diminish quite uh, um, a bit or. or get you into a, a, um, a process um, in terms of sustainability is, I think the local sourcing uh, is something um, we all, and, and it feels like it's it's getting normal, um, that you look, that you don't buy uh, your barley in China, uh, but you look, you know, uh, across the, the street, um, uh, what's the local farmer uh, doing? Um, yeah, modern energy efficient machinery, uh, stuff that everyone is, is um, uh, much more thinking about now than it was maybe 10, 15, 20 years of time. Um, but uh, a lot of times you can, you can really save money on that. Um, low waste, low cost methods. Uh, also, um, in terms of water, I uh, thought um, this was... Uh, something I can relate to uh, when Annabelle uh, talked about the water, because water is, is something we use so much, right, in our production process. Uh, I don't know how many thousand uh, liters of water um, uh, we use, but we are trying to um, always uh, uh, reuse it, um, so we don't have a like a, a, a big cooling tank or anything. But you, we use IBC containers, which we uh, uh, then fill with um, hot water, let it cool down, uh, and then reuse that um, in our process. And also um, uh, things like like these, um, they're they're fairly easy, um, and we we just wanted uh, to save some money, and uh, that came out of that idea, not even out of the sustainable uh, uh, idea. Um, then uh, we are setting, uh, we are offsetting the carbon footprint of our uh, sales team, so uh, or actually of our whole team. Um, uh, it's only ten of us, but. Uh, 
they drive, we are in the middle of nowhere basically, so they drive uh, their car to work. Um, uh, we have a, a small sales team, uh, so how do we do that? Um, we're trying to, or we are, we are already uh, turning them into uh, electric mobility. Uh, that's a small step, uh, but doesn't really, um, it's, it's not a big investment or anything, so you can just do that uh, very quickly. Um, and then uh, uh, re renewable energy, you, 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 you just call, uh, call one of the providers up and uh, they'll be happy to provide you with um, electric, uh, with uh, green in renewable um, electricity. Um, and that was like, as we saw before, about 30% of our uh, carbon footprint because it was uh, regular electricity before. Um, and uh, what you can also see is like photovoltaics. Um, there's there's two um, uh, roofs already uh, um, being used for that, um, and that's uh, for example uh, uh, an investment that um, uh, has an amortization of about uh, six to seven years. In our uh, our case, uh, if we um, basically invest in more photovoltaics to um, almost get 100% uh, of the energy that we use um, from our own uh, roof. Then um, also a matter of process, uh, we, we started to, um, or we are still um, mostly using um, uh, regular grain, so no, no, not organic, uh, but in the uh, beginning of this year, gen since, since January, we have a certification to, um, to produce organic spirits, um, so we, we started to do that now. Uh, of course, uh, we all know um, whiskey takes a bit of time, so we uh, will still be selling um, our ordinary whiskey, which is quite quite okay, um, <laughs> nonetheless, um, for a while. But um, that was an, uh, another important part uh, where we said, okay, that's one one step at a time. It doesn't cost a lot, um, and uh, it just makes uh, the value chain um, for everyone much much better if we if we do that. And now that we have a a small but certain size in our region. Um, it's a uh, way better. Uh, we can approach our cooperative of farmers where we buy our, our rye from um, much better in, in terms of hey, wouldn't you um, want to go the uh, want to go organic too? Uh, um, go go the process with us, and um, and we were a proud first rye whiskey in uh, in echo totes uh, in those kind of four and a half liter glass balloons. Um, Another take on on um, on the circular um, uh, um, what do you call it circular uh, economy. economy? Sorry, uh, thank you. Um, and I've heard that there's uh, regulations in the EU that all glass bottles have to be um, uh, have to have some some sort of um, circular uh, economy uh, in the future. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. In Germany, there's quite a lot of that, um, but it doesn't. Um, it's still you don't have to pay like a, a glass deposit for wine or uh, uh, spirits or anything. Um, but I, I, I think it, it'll come um, at some point. So uh, some stuff that we still need to do that we have identified um, as as, uh, as something we, we need to think about in the future is the gas heating of the stills. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll still have gas to heat them um, in the winter. Um, then the, the type of, uh, I, I wrote, no use of our leftover mesh after distillation, funny cows. Um, that means that our distillation process is uh, set up that um, we just uh, stop um, the distillation process after we, we reached our, um, our middle cut. Um, so then you still have uh, leftover alcohol in the mesh and we don't filter it. Uh, so it would actually be, uh, if it wouldn't be alcoholic, it would be good to feed pigs or, or as fertilizer. Um, but uh, farmers don't want it because there's still alcohol left in the uh, thing. So it, 
you'd get funny pigs and funny cows, uh, probably. So something we still have to think about. Um, and um, of course, uh, the, the whole point of, of fermentation, um, I thought like in, in big breweries, I guess there is probably technique to uh, um, pick, pick up that CO2 uh, in big distilleries as well. Um, we really don't have uh, the knowledge about that. We, we just know that there is something, but will it be, um, will it be sensible for us to invest uh, in, in such on, 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 a, on a small scale distillery? Um, that's always, you know, you always have to weigh uh, those two. Um, a big, big thing, of course, is still we, we still use a standard glass bottle uh, and paper labels. I'm, I'm sure there's there's room for improvement, which we're still looking into. I love the idea of of uh, paper bottles, uh, but I'm still not really sure if the consumer really loves the idea of paper bottles, uh, whiskey in paper bottles. Um, I'm not going to be the one, uh, the first one to try. Um, you can go ahead, tell me um, <laughs> wh what your experience is, and and uh, we'll we'll go after. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, just uh, as a conclusion, to be honest, um, most small distilleries already have, of course, uh, a small carbon footprint. It doesn't mean that we we should rest and and uh, not do anything. Um, we we definitely need uh, to do something, but sometimes it's it's just much um, smarter to go for those low hanging fruits um, uh, in first um, and really take good care of that, um, and then think about uh, big investments. So, um, global players, your turn. <laughs> Basti. Thank you so much, Basti. Uh, I think that's great. Coming in, one of the reasons for asking me, we've got a lot of new distilleries here, and I think it's really important to, to get that perspective about how hard it is and what, what issues are facing uh, distilleries who are starting up in a world which is so much more actively involved in asking the questions about sustainability. So thank you for, for uh, all that input there, Basin. We'll, we'll get you back up uh, at the end of the session. Uh, so uh, another relatively new uh, distillery is next uh, with uh, young Alex Bruce. Uh, Alex is uh, the MD of Adelphi, which is one of the rightly revered independent bottlers in Scotland. Uh, with very high, very high quality standards, uh, who then uh, built a distillery in another remote part of Scotland uh, on Ardnamurchan, uh, and has established that as, as they say in their in their publicity, Scotland's greenest distillery, uh, locally sourced uh, or fam family sourced, sourced barley, renewable energy, uh, and I think Ardnamurchan is another example of. What is happening in Scotland, a very good example of what's happening in Scotland, especially on the west coast of Scotland. It's, it's quite interesting chatting with folk recently. They're, they're saying, you know, what whiskies uh, are exciting them the most. And it's the whiskies which are coming from that, the, the western fringes and, and the Hebrides, because there just seems to be something interesting happening there in terms of addressing sustainability and indeed producing great flavor. So Alex, can you come up? Uh, one thing, you, the, the other thing you should know about Alex is that he is a member of the Order of the Scottish Samurai. So, so be careful, for he always packs a big sword, you know? <laughs> Alex, over to you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I'm delighted to say I can't yield a sword. Although the, 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 a few years ago, we had a, um, a very early interview. It was about five o'clock in the morning mm. for Breakfast Television. Yes. So it was myself and, and um, Karen Betts from the SWA standing at Annandale because it was the nearest distillery to the TV broadcasting station. <laughs> they couldn't be bothered to come any further. Um, and we were standing there in the still room, I think, uh, being asked about Brexit, which was on the horizon. But, you know, the, the vote had happened, and I think that was it. Um, <clears throat> so we did our interview. We were talking about things. And then the guy took me to, <clears throat> to one side, and he said, so you're a Bruce. And we're in Bruce country, you know, uh, Annandale. And he said, um, do, you share, do you share any traits, or would you say you shared any traits with your ancestor, Robert the Bruce? And, you know, spare of the moment question completely at five o'clock in the morning, what do you answer? <laughs> so rather than saying, oh, diplomacy or something <laughs> like that, <laughs> I, I said, well, I'm quite good with a sword. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, enough of that. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I'm just going to start, I'm going to cheat, if, that, if that's allowed. I'm going to start by showing you a very short film of where we are. Um, Annabelle described it beautifully already. Uh, we're just across the water from Nick Nian. But just to give you an idea of quite how remote um, that part of Scotland is, if we could see the film, that'd be fantastic. So, sustainability. <laughs> well, if I go back to um, the beginning, I joined Adelphi back in 2004. Uh, to give you an idea of the size of the company, uh, there were two of us, and we had about 250 bottles um, of independently bottled uh, Scotch whiskey at the time. We grew. Um, we were very lucky that we hit the ground running uh, as single malt, the category of single malt Scotch whiskey, was really starting to boom. You've got to remember that you know it's still quite a new category. Even back to uh, what, 1979, 1980, I think Macallan produced its first single malt. Um, so we are still within, a you know, fairly early days. So really, by about 2005, 2006, we were seeing a huge uh, increase in demand. So you'd think that's fantastic for your business. Adelphi's going to boom. But of course, if you're an independent bottler, you're relying on third-party supply. So you're relying, you're relying on other distilleries to produce the whiskey that you then select. Um, and if you are quite particular about the whiskies that you select, which we uh, always have been, um, you have a very small volume uh, to work with. So I had successfully gone around the world selling the stuff, but then realized that we didn't have enough uh, to feed the markets, which we'd opened up. Um, so I remember a meeting in 2007 uh, with our board, which started off by me saying, I think we're going to flatline. I think, you know, we've kind of reached our peak um, uh, and we've got a few options, but I want to know what the, the main shareholders think. <coughs> um, so the first option was to go out and buy a distillery, a working distillery with stock. Second option was to become more of a tra traditional independent bottler. So filling uh, new make spirit into cask, which we would then mature ourselves. And the third option was to build a distillery and take the, the um, production within our own grasp, if you like. <coughs> and for some very strange reason, we chose the third option. <laughs> uh, so that was the first thing. The second thing was what size, what's it going to be like, where's it going to be, all these lovely questions. And to do with the, <coughs> for the main reason, the ownership of the business was very much based in the west coast of Scotland, and in particular, the peninsula of Ardnamurchan. Um, so we are halfway along the peninsula. Um, Annabelle is across the loch uh, on the other peninsula, <laughs> just over there. And you've got Tobermory and the Isle of Mull just at the bottom of the loch. It's the second largest uh, sea loch in Scotland, Loch Sunet. Um, if you were to travel the length of Ardnamurchan in a car going at reasonable speed, and reasonable is not very fast, it's a single track road, uh, it takes you about an hour and 20 minutes from end to end. And that's the proper peninsula, not the peninsula, the wider peninsula that the council likes to think it is now for tourist reasons. Um, so really, you know, it, it is remote, um, 
the best place we found was Glenbeg because it had an abundance of water. It had enough land to build distilleries, uh, sorry, build warehouses up the hill, as we now have had to, d to do over the last eight years. But crucially, it was sandwiched between two, the two communities. So you've got uh, uh, Struntian Salen at one end, and you've got Kilhoen at the other end, totaling out of the tourist season about 500 people, uh, resident population, and sadly declining, as many remote parts of Scotland are, and really have been for a long, long time now. We have a terribly checkered history about replacing people uh, with more efficient ways of making a living. So from the outset, one of the things, not only us as a whiskey business, but also our shareholders who lived in the area and were really trying to rejuvenate the area, from the outset, our biggest ambition was about people, about the sustainability of people and the su sustainability of place. Um, so we built our local team uh, very, very quickly. We brought in a little bit of expertise to get us off the ground uh, back in 2013. Um, but very quickly, we knew that expertise would leave because of the midges and the winter, and it did. <laughs> and we were left uh, with a local team, which has uh, blossomed into this uh, amazingly um, uh, bright, forward-thinking, uh, passionate a group of people, uh, led by the man who used to be the school bus driver. And the only reason he applied for the job uh, back in the day was he drove past collecting the kids for school and saw a sign going up in the field saying, coming soon, <laughs> and a sort of rather artist impression of a distillery. So he thought, yeah, we'll go for that. So we've got bus drivers, we've got fish farmers, we've got farmers, shepherds. They're all now part of this, this great team. And that's all very well. But what do you do for the future? Um, Annabelle touched on this as well. It's absolutely crucial if you're trying to um, establish uh, an industry in a community uh, and preserve it for the future, that you encourage the next generation and the next generation and so on. So we came up with an idea, and it may sound a little bit stupid, um, but it actually seems to be working so far. We came up with an idea that the local charity, the Arden American Trust, would buy a cask of Arden American spirit for every child under a certain age. Uh, living or being born into the peninsula. Um, and that cask would mature as does the child, you'd hope. <laughs> and when the child becomes an adult of drinking age, they then uh, get to take that cask and sell it back to the distillery for a profit because they basically got it for nothing. Um, that profit they then use, I if they want to, uh, for tertiary education, for learning more about distilling, for all those kind of things. And meanwhile, we're encouraging them to join the business as students, as apprentices, and see how it actually physically works. Not just there, they may be more interested in sales and marketing, in which case they come to um, our other site near Edinburgh. But it's about engaging with the community and hopefully meaning that they stay there and they don't go to university and stay in Glasgow or Edinburgh or wherever that university um, actually is. So that, that's our medium to long-term goal. We've now just reached phase two in that we've got four 16-year-olds coming through this year uh, who we're going to start bringing in in, in in different apprentice roles, if you like, um, uh, while they're still at school. We were slightly shot in the foot when we launched this campaign, and we made a bit of noise about it because we felt that it could be replicated in many other parts of remote Scotland. So we sent out press releases and all the rest of it, and it was all going really well until The Times, one of the biggest national newspapers, uh, headlined us on the front page, and it said, Scottish distillery sells booze to children. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I spent pretty much two days fielding calls from the Portman Group and uh, various other people saying, no, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> um, but anyway, so th that's one of the wheels that we put in motion about sustainability of place and, and people, and it's uh, so, so important uh, to us. Um, uh, that's just showing you roughly where we are very, very remote. It takes about four, four and a half hours from Edinburgh or Glasgow to get there. So, of course, being remote, we talked about people. We now need to talk about the other raw materials, the resources uh, that a distillery has, has to use. Um, and again, we were very fortunate that uh, one of our shareholders who runs uh, most of the land, who works most of the land around the distillery on the peninsula, had already foreseen the importance of using local 
materials where possible for everything. Um, and he, uh, the first thing we did with him was to work out wha where his business could help ours, where our business could help his. So if you like, this very basic circular economy. Um, and it, even if it was only two or three strands or, or p points on that circle to start with, we're adding more points as we go, and that circle's becoming bigger as it starts to expand into neighboring economies and, and, and as we start to extract from neighboring economies as, as well. First one, very, very important for whiskey making, is water, of course. Now, you, you would have thought on the west coast of Scotland there is an abundance of water, and generally speaking, there is. Uh, normally, when the tourists arrive, it's very important that we get them extremely wet and bitten by midges. Um, but pretty much from April to June, you hardly see a drop of water in our part of Scotland. And it's not just a one-off. It's been happening every year since we started production. So one of the earliest things we did is we actually did put in a, a, a what they call a water economizer. Uh, it's, it's like a modern cooling tower, but it's slightly more efficient and uses far less um, chemicals. Uh, in order to retain the temperature at what you need to, you know, not too hot when you're distilling, we put in subcoolers as well. Um, so these are uh, additional cooling mechanism uh, which keep our, our condensers at the right temperature. So we have reduced our cooling water coming from the river, which also provi provides our hydroelectricity as well, but we've reduced the cooling water uh, by 85% uh, since we put that economizer in. We are allowing a little bit to trickle out and be replaced every now and then. And to be honest, it's more about the biodiversity of actually the cooling pond and the river below us. Because if we stop our flow completely, you're starting to get stagnant water and, and insects and things are not coming around. You know, so you've just got to keep it flowing a wee bit. Um, the next one, and, and again, Annabelle uh, has mentioned this, uh, how do you heat the place? What's, availably, what's available locally? Why bring in heavy oil or gas or whatever? Um, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, biomass boilers may not be the most carbon dioxide uh, uh, friendly in terms of output, but in terms of a local raw material, wood chip is fantastic. Um, the peninsula has a huge amount of commercial forestry on it, all up, out of sight, on top of the hills uh, and behind. And in the old days, um, right, well, right up until we built the distillery, most, the majority of that timber was being taken out to Fort William, to the nearest mill. So that involves heavy goods vehicles coming in, single track road, uh, timber going out at cost. You know, there's hardly any profit in it at all to, to the person who's harvesting it. Um, and if you don't have that incentive, you don't cut it, a lot of it's standing dead, you need to get rid of it, you need to replant it. So we became the biggest uh, reason for harvesting of timber to take place locally. And the shareholder had set up a plant two miles from us, so all of our wood chip is harvested there. Uh, oh sorry, the, 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 the timber comes in harvested, the wood chip is, is created, brought to us by tractor and trailer. The trailer then takes the draft back from our mash tun. The draft is then uh, uh, combined with the pot ale, which pipes over the hill to the same place. The pot ale is evaporated using the brash from the timber. So if you imagine a tree's cut down, you've got the bit you can use to chip, and then you've got all the excess, the branches and stuff, which aren't much good. That is used to, he to heat a combined heat and power plant uh, at the plant. So not only is that providing the electricity off-grid to uh, evaporate the pot ale, but it's also feeding back into the grid as an extra, extra electrical provider source, if you like, for the local community. So everything is being used to within an inch of its life, all these raw materials. Um, we also pipe uh, the spent lees back over. So one of the other co-products of distilling Spent lees, you can combine it with pot ale, you can use it on fields. We actually don't have very many fields in our Demerkin. Most of it's hill, uh, and it's very hard, and not actually that beneficial for us to be, to be spraying these, these hills. So the spent lees go through uh, reed beds, and then back into the water course as, as a completely clear um, liquid. So that, that part of the circular economy is hugely important to us. If you were, and, and we were, setting out to build a new distillery and the costs involved and the extra work involved in going to these extra lengths for sustainability, um, 
if I can offer any advice, is long term or medium to long term, it is absolutely worth it. Um, I'll give you what, uh, just a few examples. Short term, the biomass boiler was a disaster. Uh, it was supplied, we were the first distillery in Scotland to be 100% reliable on a steam wood chip fired biomass boiler. So there was, there was no or very little expertise out there in terms of maintenance. The boiler itself came from Switzerland, beautiful bit of kit, apart from the fact the lorry driver used a postcode in his sat nav, not realizing that the postcodes in Ardnamurk can actually last for about 10 miles. And he arrived in the dead of night and uh, turned a sharp right turn when the, his sat nav told him to and ended up in someone's garden. Uh, so given the size of the truck, uh, a crane was ordered from Glasgow to come up the next day and retrieve him from his garden. Meanwhile, the back end of his lorry had blocked the single track road so the school kids couldn't get to school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so the crane came up and crashed into a tractor on the way. <laughs> so you then had a lorry with a crane big enough to lift the lorry. We then needed to get a crane big enough to lift the crane to lift the lorry. <laughs> yeah, we weren't very popular. Um, anyway, the biomass boiler went in. The um, maintenance company that came with it, the agents, if you like, from the UK, uh, were terrible. They, they said, oh, that'd be fine, you know, just get on with it. And within weeks, the thing had broken. Uh, and we had basically two years of stop-start production the worst you can possibly do. When you start a new distillery, you want to hit the ground running. You want to fill those warehouses. Because otherwise, when you actually come to sell the stuff, you're constantly chasing your tail. But we had that problem. We had the two years of alarms going off at the night, in the middle of the night, the thing just, just not working. So finally, we jumped ship. We found a really good maintenance team. And ever since, it's been touch a lot of wood, chip, <laughs> very good, or more or less. Um, uh, the other, uh, the, the cost implication of putting in biomass, the, so the boiler, if you compare a, a, an average oil or gas boiler uh, for a size of distillery like ours, I think you're talking probably today, maybe a couple of hundred thousand pounds, something like that, quarter of a million. The biomass boiler plus the infrastructure to run it, so I'm talking 30,000 litre accumulation tank for steam in the roof space, because you can't just switch on the steam from biomass, it's too slow. Uh, so all of these extra things, and, and even though we had precise end-to-end -end in terms of equipment, this shoehorned uh, biomass system going in was confusing everyone. Uh, all the engineers were scratching their heads, but we did it. But it was over, it was about 1.3 million, and that was in 2013. So that, that was the amount of cost differential. We are lucky, or we were lucky in the UK to receive what's called the re re Renewable Heat Incentive, so the government pays you back for every you know, kilowatt that you burn. Um, that won't be there forever. But from us, it was an incentive at least, and it was a, a, a financial assistant to be able to, to hit this sustainable journey um, running. The other thing, just very briefly, on the, uh, the, the local environment and, and trying to protect it as much as possible, by using all of this um, uh, local forestry, we took off the, the road. We took all of that heavy transport going to Fort William uh, with timber. So that was immediately uh, seen and welcomed by the locals. We also removed immediately that we produced the draft and the pot ale for the animals, the cows living on the peninsula. We uh, reduced or removed the need for incoming bulk animal feed, again, heavy goods. Now, we have replaced that with the occasional uh, lorry of casks and a lorry of barley, but it's nothing like what it was. Um, so it's just about getting that balancing act right. Lovely steaming pot ale going to the cows and the circular economy. Now, I've talked about the, 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 the sort of central circular economy. We have a wider economy that we uh, are very pleased to be able to work with. So the second half of the business is down in Fife, where my family farms and has been there for about 500 years. And I remember growing up uh, with fields, surrounded by fields of golden promise and all these lovely barley varietals, uh, feeding the Scotch whiskey industry. So feeding Macallan, feeding Bermore, you know, uh, directly in those days. And then it went, it, it disappeared. We've, we've talked earlier about the fact that there are only two or three commercial maltsters now. We used to have maltsters everywhere. Uh, I'm delighted to say they are coming back. I mean, Crafty Maltsters in East Fife is a perfect example of that. Small batch heritage crops on their farm, malting it, 
and not just uh, for beer, but also for whiskey. We need more of that. Uh, we need more people joining the dots. But the first thing I did when we, we decided to build the distillery was talk to our farmer and say, look, can we contract you directly? You know, it's not local barley, it's four hours away, but it's barley, it's, it's, it's control of the supply chain. So knowing where everything comes from, being able to have input in it. Um, and I think it was James, I can't remember who was talking about this earlier, about how we treat our farmers in terms of wanting maximum yield, we pay per ton, all the rest of it. We're now talking, because I want to grow exciting crops, we're, we're now talking about uh, a value per acre harvested. So if I take one field and I say to John, uh, the farmer, every year, I say, right, I want you to grow Chevalier, or I want you to grow uh, Plumage Archer or something. Or you know, if it's sheltered, maybe one of these crops which grows a bit higher that doesn't normally work in Scotland. He's going to go, yeah, but I'm only going to get X amount per ton. Uh, and I say, well, that's fine we'll pay you for the acreage of that field. So you know whatever happens, whatever th the weather does to us, you will still get the same amount of money. We may lose out, but we're gonna have a more interesting product at the end of the day. And this, everything is now circling back to uh, what is the most important thing for us, and I'm sure the majority of this room and people watching is flavor. If you want to have fl a good flavor, diversity of flavor, unique style, you need to be thinking about all these different elements. And thank God that it is actually very much part of our sustainable journey uh, because we are being able to control uh, each part of it. Um, so yeah, that, that's really the angle that we've taken uh, since we started. So we're just about eight years in. Uh, we released our first whiskey, give or take, uh, just over 18 months ago, it, right in the middle of the pandemic, which was great fun. Uh, actually worked in our favor. We don't have a massive marketing budget. Uh, so online tastings uh, are very cheap to run and you, you reach a large audience. And hopefully we can all do more of those and, and spend less time on the plane um, burning fuel. Annabelle talked about glass uh, and, and you know the 100% recycled glass bottles, which is fantastic. We haven't been able to get to that yet, but what we have done is made sure as many of our, our materials are coming from uh, uh, the UK, so fairly local, and the manufacturer that we deal with for glass is running off 90% renewable power. Uh, so even though th there's still a certain amount of non-recycled glass in our glass bottles, we're about 70% recycled. Uh, it is being produced in a very sustainable manner. Um, we took a slight extra step, and possibly one step too far, I'm not sure, uh, with our boxes, uh, with our cartons, and we went 100% recycled board. First guys to do it, I believe, anyway. It smells like nappies. <laughs> or at least the first batch did. Uh, we changed mills uh, and find one that doesn't smell. But we have just finished uh, going out to all of our importers around the world and asking that lovely question, can we get rid of the box, full stop. And it's been really interesting, the feedback. I would say about 90% have come back saying, from our point of view, yes. And that there's been some buts. And they've actually, the ones that have taken it quite seriously have gone to their consumers, the guys coming into their shops into their uh, on trade, into the bars and all the rest of it. And they've asked them, what about, you know, what it, would you buy this out of American if it wasn't in a box? And I, I have to say, I'm really sorry to say, that over 50% are still saying, we wouldn't buy it because we're gonna gift it. We want it to be in a box. So it's a shame. We, we still have to educate that, that next uh, part, the consumer. And the more of us that do it, I think it will become easier. To be honest, the cost of cartons and everything else that we're dealing with now is so prohibitive, and it's only going one way, that I'm kind of hoping that secretly that it will force our hand and we'll all do it anyway. Um, so really just to finish on, on, um, on this sustainable topic and what we've done. Um, and generally speaking, when I start to talk about this, and I'm gonna keep it very brief, everyone falls asleep. Um, so please do, I, d I don't mind. <laughs> uh, the word is blockchain. And we have talked over the last day and a half uh, we've, we've touched on communications, we've touched on marketing departs, departments, we've touched on provenance, we've touched on traceability, we've touched on all these topics which all form part of this sustainable journey. Um, I'm not going to uh, uh, lie by saying that we saw all of this coming together back in 2016 when, when I started working with blockchain, but the more we're working with it, the more it, it seems to be the right fit for what we want to do. So we want to be able to record everything we do 
Um, again, this has been discussed today. We want to record it in an honest way, in a transparent way, and a way that the consumer then feels uh, some comfort that we are being completely truthful. And I'm not just saying we, as in the manufacturer, Bad American, I'm talking about the supply chain as well, who all have the potential to input into our blockchain. So for those of you who don't know what blockchain is, very, very simply, it is a ledger-based system up in the cloud which requires third parties to authenticate the, um, the information going into it. So most notably, it's used for cryptocurrencies to avoid going to the bank. And if you're not using a banker, you need some kind of assurance that where your money is going is the right place or where the money is coming from. So that, that is why it's seen as the, the kind of auth authentic method. So all of our production data at the moment is going into our blockchain ledger. It's being authenticated. It's having that sort of key, that lock put on it. And as we go, all of our environmental stuff is going in there now too as well. So our, our heat usage, our electricity usage, everything like that is all going in there. We're also encouraging our farmer. We're encouraging our car supplier. We're encouraging everyone that's feeding into us to feed in third-party information that we have no handle on. That then gets authenticated and sits in there too. Now, what then you use it for? Well, we hope that there'll be some structure around green credentials, around carbon neutral, around all of this lovely stuff that becomes globally recognized. And we can use that to feed directly into it. In the meantime, we have a QR code on our bottle, which you simply scan with your phone, and you get everything you possibly want to know and more, including what color pants the, uh, the, <laughs> the mash tun, <laughs> the mash man was wearing. Uh, no, you don't quite like that. You might. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's something that we've done just because we feel comfortable using it, and I think it's quite a modern technique which could be adopted uh, more widely. Um, anyway, I think that's probably enough waffle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs> thank you, Alex. Thank you. Excellent. You can, can sit down. I can sit down. You can <laughs> sit down. <laughs> But you'll have to stand up again quite soon. Uh, so there we go. So uh, we have our, our final speaker. Where is he? He's there, lurking in the corner. Uh, great stuff. Oscar Bruno from Agitator. Agitator? Everybody says agitator, you say, but agitator. Uh, in Sweden, uh, 11 years working in the drinks industry. And one of the very few people to have been at every single World Whiskey Forum. So he gets a badge. I think. And uh, now running, or, or, or one of the team running, uh, this super secret distillery where if you try to get in without permission, they'll shoot you. Uh, this is what we learned the other night as we were drinking a fantastic rye whiskey from them. Uh, radical ideas about how whiskey can be made, which is exactly what we're wanting to hear because uh, I don't know about you, but th this idea of the cookie cutter distillery is beginning to kind of bore me, you know? And this ain't a cookie cutter distillery. Oscar. Yep. Makes sense. So, um, let's see. Right. Yeah. Thank you. you Thank Sorry, you. Um, good to be here and finally talking about our distillery. Um, we're called Agitator in Swedish, if you want to know or agitator, and uh, I want to tell you about our story, how we approached uh, distilling, and what we have done to change the way we can distill the spirits, and try to make it a bit more energy efficient. Because uh, my core belief is like, distilling is an old um, production method, it's been around for a couple of hundred years, we've pretty much done nothing to improve it. Um, so we had some ideas that we wanted to try out, mainly vacuum distilling, uh, which works in a, in a really good way. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about vac vacuum distilling, what we're doing that's quite different from uh, more traditional distilleries, and also our take on sustainability, how we can be a bit more sustainable in our production. Uh, firstly, our company, Agitator. Um, it's a strange word, though, Agitator. Kind of, in Sweden, um, it means both like rebellion or... Uh, the equipment used to stir things up, and I think it's the same in English. 
And that's pretty much how we uh, see ourselves. We are one of the rebellions in whiskey making. We want to change the way we produce whiskey and we want to take a new approach that's pretty much not allowed in Scotland. Um, so we, we might uh, be the, the thorn in the side for, for Scottish industry or like the, the leg of brick under your foot, because we're in Denmark. Um, <coughs> so, so we're a bit annoying, um, but our belief is that we can do things differently. So um, we have our manifesto, uh, usually looks better, but um, <coughs> what if is our keyword? And um, we think that what if we can make whiskey taste even better? With the right mix of experimentation and bold approach, we believe it's possible. Our whiskey is still the, on the vacuum to enhance the flavor, a technique used by few other malt whiskey distilleries. Uh, when it comes to ingredients and aging methods, we focus on taste rather than tradition. We hope you join us as we agitate from a different way to make whiskey, taking a new approach and asking ourselves, what if? So what if we can do whiskey in a better way? What if we can change the mindset of how we produce whiskey? What if it works? So we started out, um, our company started back in 2015, and since then we put everything, our ideas to the drawing board. We started to find suppliers of new equipment, and we started to build this distillery. And it took us until 2018 before we started our uh, production. So last uh, autumn we released our first product to the market, and we received really good uh, reviews of pretty much all our products so far. So apparently it, it works to take a new approach and be bold and try to find a new way to, to agitate. So even though we, we consider ourselves as rebellions, um, we are the sophisticated rebellion. So <laughs> with that, we mean that we're knowledgeable. We know how to distill whiskey. We've been producing whiskey in Sweden for quite a while. Um, me, myself, I've worked in different distillery before kind of hands-on, learning how to distill the, the manual labor going into distilling. Um, so we're knowledgeable, so we know how to do it. But we also know how to improve it, because there are lots of papers lying around, like uh, different doctors wrote a thesis on how to make whiskey better. So we read those, and we got some knowledge, and we applied knowledge to our production. Innovative. We don't want to do what everybody else is doing. For us, the only reason to exist is to challenge the, the convention and do something differently. So we have new, lots of new techniques in our distillery that doesn't really exist elsewhere. Um, <coughs> and we use lots of different methods for producing the whiskey or aging it. So innovative. And we're unique. Unique in that way that we, we want to differentiate us from, from other uh, producers. We don't want to be another Scottish distillery in Sweden. We want to be a Swedish distillery showing the world it's possible to do something differently. Sustainable. From the start, we focused on building a distillery that's sustainable, or at least uh, trying to be sustainable. Because you can always do better, but for us, it was really important to use renewable energy sources. Uh, the vacuum distillation is a process to kind of reduce the energy you need for distillation. So it's kind of combined with sustainability. So what do we do then? <laughs> it's the, the big question. Um, <coughs> we use lots of different techniques. Um, we use wet milling, um, which is not as common today. Uh, might be more common in the future, but um, this technique allows us to place our mill, as you can see on the picture, in the middle of the distillery, removing all the uh, hazard uh, dust explosion risks, because uh, we're adding water straight into the mill. Uh, a bit faster process, because the crushed grain goes straight up into the mash tun. Um, it's a good way to try new different techniques to, to mill the grain, because most distilleries here in Scotland still use the same mills from 200 years ago. So a new type of mill. High gravity brewing. Um, we're trying to brew as strong beer or wash uh, as we can. Our goal is to hit at least 10% of alcohol, higher if possible. Because in the end, if you brew to a higher strength, uh, we use less water in the brewing process. And 
water is expensive to heat. And also, if we heat a higher alcohol content, the specific heat capacity of alcohol is lower than water. So when we boil it, it requires less heat to boil it. Uh, so it makes sense. But in turn, we have to focus on the flavor of the spirit. And if we brew to a higher gravity, we increase the ester production, which makes the spirit taste better. Win-win. <laughs> Different grains. Um, we're located outside of Scotland, so we're allowed to use different grains, and we still call it whiskey. We don't have to put grain whiskey on the belt, um, on the label. So we both produce rye whiskey. We use different malts. We pretty much used all the malts we can find: so oats, uh, wheat, uh, rye. Combining all of those, even so just to try to do something differently. And our mill is uh, set up so we can do pretty much anything uh, apart from milling uh, corn. So lots of different po possibilities here to, <coughs> sorry, to produce new exciting flavors in, in the mill. Long fermentation times. Um, we ferment for at least seven days, uh, mainly due to the high gravity brewing. We need a bit longer time for, for the fermentation to take place, but it also allows us to work more with yeast. We can underpitch yeast, make it produce different flavors that requires longer fermenting times, and also end up with a bit cleaner profile on our wash after fermentation, which is really important when we go to distillation. <coughs> and we use vacuum distillation. And this is kind of a hard concept to, to grasp. Um, we have four stills here in the picture, and all of those stills are distilling at lower pressure than our atmosphere. So we, we don't put them in total vacuum, because they would be like small raisins if we do that. Uh, <laughs> so we just lower pressure slightly inside the, the stills with a vacuum pump. So we run them at 0 0.3 bars at absolute pressure, uh, or 0 0.8 bars, which is quite low. Uh, more of that a uh, bit ahead. And as you can see, um, <coughs> we have two pair of different stills. We have two kind of tall ones that's going up out of the picture, and two short ones. And this is actually uh, two production uh, lines that we have in our distillery. The tall, tall stills producing a lighter spirit, and the Shorter ones producing a heavier style of spirit. So even though we produce one mash, um, we divide it into two different production lines, producing two different spirits from the same mash and pretty much utilizing all the flavors that the raw material can give us. So it's a different approach on how to be flexible inside a, a distillery. Different aging methods. Um, apart from doing a lot of things in the distillery, uh, we fill our barrels at a lower filling strength. Uh, we put them in the warehouse at 55% alcohol. It's quite low. And we use different kinds of wood as well. So apart from just using oak, uh, we're using chestnut uh, to a quite a large extent. All our products today have some small amount of chestnut in them. So it's different wood that we use. And this gives us kind of a different flavor to, to the spirit. <coughs> as, as mentioned, <coughs> sorry, we have some renewable energy sources. Uh, we're connected to a um, central heating district boiler in, in our community, which essentially is a huge boiler creating uh, lots of hot water that goes to every household in this community. And this hot water is super heated, so it's 105 degrees warm. So we're just tapping into this system. Uh, so it's pretty much a plug-and-play solution. We don't have to pay those huge amounts for wood boilers. <laughs> this is stupid. But, uh, <laughs> so what we do is we, we, just, um, we just put a heat exchanger and get the energy we need, and we just pay for the amount we re reduce um, uh, the temperature. So it's a really efficient system, and it, it only works if we're kind of in the central of a city or quite a big city. So we're, we're doing everything opposite as the, the previous talkers. Uh, it's kind of fun. So here is our four uh, different stills. And 
just wanted to show you this picture because it's kind of unique. Um, first, you're struck by the, the blue insulation of the stills. Then you see some copper, and behind all that copper is extremely lots of pipes. <laughs> and this, the, this is the issue with vacuum distilling. Um, it's kind of hard to do. <laughs> you, you need to, to figure out a way to, to um, make your plants run efficiently. And for us, we, we kind of had to install lots of ventilation pipes and lots of heat recovery pipes. And in the end, we ended up expending 3,000 hours of welding to put all the piping together. Um, so it took a while. <laughs> but to, to be honest, it was worth it. Uh, it it's a different approach, and for me, it's more beautiful to look at uh, the stainless steel pipes nowadays than, than the copper pot stills. So you kind of shift your focus. Um, but yeah, they're really unique. And just to clarify how, how they work, um, just in a simple way, uh, you can see the two stills to the right here. Um, there are our spirit stills. And these get 105 degrees hot water fed into them and we have external boilers. And we're lowering the pressure to 0 0.8 bars, so we have a boiling point at 80 degrees. So we're utilizing 105 down to 80 for energy inside these stills. The residual heat going off the stills, um, it's 80 degrees hot water going off the still. That you should usually go back to the network and just be heated again. But since we're using vacuum, we can regulate the pressure and lowering of boiling points so in our wash stills, the two to the left, uh, we're reducing the pressure to 0 0.3 bars, thusly remove, uh, reducing the boiling point to 60 degrees. So we've taken the residual heat from the two first uh, spirit stills and using that to fire the second pair of stills. And that's pretty much what makes us quite energy efficient. And also that's the reason for all the pipes. <laughs> so, <coughs> so you, you just to kind of um, give you an idea of how we approached um, this typical difficult topic of distilling. Um, we started out by asking ourselves, like, what is whiskey? We spent a huge amount of time on Google trying to find out what is whiskey. After a while, we found this. <laughs> and <laughs> this book isn't fun to read. Uh, if you kind of start to read the, all the regulation of Scottish whiskey, it's a lot of things you can't do. And what we found out was, uh, well, it's traditional. It's based on what you're doing and what you have done for lots of, lots of years. Um, so it's based on traditional. And if you keep reading, you find out that it's quite conservative. So they want to keep it as it is. But in the end, it's also extremely good because today every consumer knows what to expect when they buy a bottle of whiskey. And to be honest, this book has helped it. It's extremely good to have those frameworks or kind of um, the rules to, to play with, because um, it, it makes the consumer know what to expect when they buy a bottle of whiskey. But as we are the small rebellion, uh, we <laughs> broke the rules. Uh, so I spent a lot of time making this animation. Uh, <laughs> so it's, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's pretty much the, the biggest feat of my career. <laughs> but with that said, we're quite innovative. Um, we wanted to find a new way to produce whiskey and we know that the regulations aren't really enough. We have to focus on the flavor instead. And for a flavor of whiskey, it's kind of easy. The consumer uh, expects a certain flavor uh, but to produce it, we can be quite innovative. And we can use different grains, we can use different casks, different wood types, uh, different filling strength. We can use lots of different new exciting technologies to make this possible. And what's the reason to do it? Well, we want to improve whiskey. We want to make whiskey better for the consumer. We want to develop new flavors and help whiskey grow as a category. Uh, <coughs> and in the end, uh, by doing that, we also have to think about the sustainable uh, things we have to do for the whiskey industry, because we're producing a luxury uh, uh, product. It's, it's not a necess necessary product for any human, but most of them 
humans want to consume this, and it should be made with sustainable uh, uh, raw material. So sustainability is key feature for uh, pretty much any luxury product, in my opinion. So <coughs> we're not sustainable, I should have changed this, but um, <coughs> we're trying to be as sustainable as we can, and we did lots of things to, to get there. Um, so the first thing we did was design the whole plant to be efficient. Um, <coughs> we started looking on the, the mashing, the brewing part of, of the production, and we also started looking how can we recycle and reuse heat. And the more you start to think about where you have excess heat in the plant, the crazier you get. <laughs> and that's pretty much my case nowadays. We, we try trying to scavenge heat from every step of the process. Um, I think we were operational for like two months before Chris and I, we, we thought like, well, do you have lots of heat in the fermenters? I want to scavenge that heat and put it into my process instead. So we redirected some pipes, and now we're, as soon as someone opens a tap in the distillery, that water goes through our heat, um, our fermenting tanks and the cooling coils, uh, just giving us hot water instead of just making heat inside the fermenter. So we, we're actually reducing the temperature in the fermenting tank as well as we're getting free hot water. So it's a good trade-off for us. Uh, but lots of different things, lots of new challenges when we start to think about how to recycle heat. We use new technologies. Uh, the vacuum distillation is one of those. And that's one of the techniques I hope will be uh, used in most distillers in the future, because usually you have a surplus of heat in the distillery, but it's too low for, uh, for you to use in the production. But if you can control your boiling points inside the stills, you can utilize it in a better way, and you can be a bit more <coughs> energy efficient. Um, so we use the vacuum distillation. Also the Cobe product treatment. Our draft is used for cattle feed, and our spent lease and pot ale is used to create biogas. So we have a truck coming every week uh, collecting the, uh, the pot ale, and it goes to a small city next to us. They produce biogas, which in turn is put into the public transport in that city. So for us, we're getting away, uh, or all our co products are used to somewhat um, a renewable uh, uh, system. Or, yeah. And also the, the renewable, renewable energy sources. Um, this central heating um, boiler is using wood pellets for for it as an uh, energy source. And during winter, because in Sweden it gets quite cold during winter, uh, they might be able to use uh, different raw materials like garbage from, from different households in Sweden. So um, it's actually quite a good, efficient way uh, to get, in, get energy. But it's mainly wood pellets. <laughs> Lastly, um, the future of whiskey. Uh, we only touched on a few things that we think we can change the, the whiskey industry. Uh, we think we can use new exciting techniques for, for making it possible. Uh, I think vacuum distillation is uh, certainly one of them, and it actually works. Uh, but in the end, uh, we should focus on trying to make it as green as possible. It's not just building a new plant for, for the sake of it, but use the new techniques to to make it a bit more green from start. And it will, in the end, save you money because uh, energy is one of those raw materials that always um, will get a bit more expensive. So the less you can use, the better it is for the future. So green is one of them. Uh, we're hoping to focus a bit more on grain to recycling instead of glass. Uh, and with that said, um, we teamed up with an uh, app company called Bauer, and they actually allows you to recycle your, uh, your bottle. So if you buy a bottle from us, you can use this application, <coughs> scan the barcode, go to a recycling station, log into the app, and you get a small cashback from each bottle you bring to, um, to the recycling station. And this is just a small step to, to encourage the consumer to take the, the extra responsibility when they buy a bottle. 
constantly improving. Uh, when I read that book about the regulations of, of Scottish whiskey, uh, it seems a bit outdated, to, to be fair. And we should be improving and allowing new exciting technologies to uh, be possible for pretty much every producer, because it will help the industry to be a bit more interesting and we can develop new flavors. Uh, so in the end, it's for the consumer and we can make it better and greener by using new technologies and improving uh, whiskey as a category. And we have to question tradition, so yeah. Uh, if we do a thing or the same thing for quite a long time, we've been producing for four years, so most of the things uh, might come, become tradition, like we do it in a certain way, and we have to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Can we do it better? Is there a reason for doing this? And if we can't answer that question, well, then you probably need to improve your process. You have to rethink what you're doing. So you have to question tradition. <coughs> and lastly, the future of whiskey is vacuum distilled. <laughs> 100% sure of that. And just to show you, um, this is our core range, our two bottles that we produced. Uh, so it's our single malt whiskey and our peated one. Uh, just to, to give you a, a small, small hint, because I hope you will taste this later on, but uh, the green label is produced in our tall stills and the red is from our uh, short stills. So the same raw material inside these two bottles. Total different character, uh, but um, yeah, made from the same, um, same old. And we also have some special expression where the pink one is uh, matured uh, or finished in chestnut wood. And we brought this as well if you want to taste uh, how chestnut whiskey tastes. So yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. Well, great. I think we need, we need radical thinking, don't we? we? We need people agitating because if, if, by God, if distillers don't start agitating, then what the hell are we here for? You know. So thank you so much. Thank you for all of our speakers uh, during this session. We're actually bizarrely running a little bit early. Uh, so I think we'll take a wee break now and then come back and do the, the Q&A sessions. That sound sensible? Yeah. Fine, okay. Uh, you can all go and find some coffee and Zoe, Ingvar and I will round you up in about uh, 20 minutes, 20, 20 minutes, okay. <coughs>